Welcome to Break the Record Podcast. I am your host, Anna Turner. This podcast was created to help facilitate positive change in the music industry through real stories from the most inspirational people in music. By tuning in, you'll receive actionable tips on how to improve your creativity, health, and quality of life. All views expressed in this podcast are my personal views. William Luff is an absolute music industry veteran who has worked all over the major label system and now runs his own very successful PR company, Willful Publicity in London. Their roster includes Iron Maiden, Alice in Chains, Willow Smith, Within Temptation and many, many others. In this episode, Will and I discuss what it takes to enter and stay in the music industry as well as best practices for PR nightmares. So let's fucking go. Hi, William Love, and welcome to your Break the Record podcast. Hello. Hi, Anna. Lovely to be here. Yeah, I gotta say, like, out of all of the projects and all of the artists who I've worked with, which is by the hundreds at this point, Mm -hmm. and uh, obviously with some teams we work more closely and with some uh, not so closely, but when it comes to you and just, like, your expertise in, in PR in general with your, like, vast background, but still just, like, it's one of those where you're in the team I can always trust in the PR like that's that's just impeccable of your skill in in this craft honestly it's just fantastic that's good to know Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I mean, it, one of the things I've always the whole way through my career and have always instilled in my team is communication you know it's mm-hmm. reply to the emails if if your <laughs> client if you know yourself um wants something and ask for something don't be that idiot who just forgets to reply and loses the email in the inbox because then the client gets upset and also it's just rude yeah. and <laughs> I conduct myself and my company the way I like to amongst my friends because you know it's all meant to be a, a very friendly thing so if someone needs something reply to them help them it's not rocket science but the amount of PRs and people in the industry in general who just um, are unreliable you know mm. they, they don't get back to people they don't behave with you know politeness and uh, and kindness in what they do and so it's good to know that you've fa- always found us reliable and easy to deal with because yeah. I think you know if you can't PR yourself and naturally be a, a good person how can you then do the job that we're meant to do you know and the job we're meant to do is uh, PR upwards make make things uh, appear and and work as smoothly as possible so the last thing I want to do is uh be on the bad side of someone like yourself but it's also part of it. I like you Anna and we've always got on very well as well so you know so it's, it's, it's fun and we've got fun projects so you know it's it's, it's a general loving <laughs> oh I appreciate that and I feel like partly PR in general as a as an industry or as a side of music industry is kind of known to be quite cutthroat at some point uh, or in some ways it's quite like okay are you able to get the coverage or not so there's a bit mm-hmm. of like this um you know cutthroat side of it which sometimes makes people appear very just intense in mm. that um especially dealing with like you know various different kinds of publications uh we can talk about that a little bit later but yeah. first of all i need to apologize to all of the listeners why my voice sounds like this because i have been at <laughs> reading festival for three days i don't usually sound like this but we are back into the festival you know a quote-unquote normalcy and um, I didn't go fully wild and I don't understand how I've done this literally like so many years and and I used to do like I think my my record was doing 13 festivals like full um, three-day festivals in the summer and I was like how is that even a thing no I know I know and they are quite wearing you're outdoors it's you know there's obviously usually some alcohol involved you're shouting over loud music you're meeting random people all the time I mean you know I've been doing it a long time when I get to festivals I'm kind of like I recognize everyone's faces can I remember their damn names no yeah so you know a lot <laughs> the of the same. time you you're, hey you're having these amazing conversations that are all really upbeat and ha <laughs> ha blah blah really vibrant and fun and at the back yeah. of your brain you're going it'll come to me it'll come to me and so you kind of keep that heightened sense of conversation going the whole way through a festival weekend and if you don't come back with a slightly sore throat then yeah. I've only got a sore throat because I've been drinking tea so uh, I've got that kind of tanniny throat at the moment so there we oh, go. Oh that is the most English thing anyone has ever said <laughs> on this podcast. I gotta be honest. But Five okay, o'clock let's... in the afternoon I'm on English breakfast too. <laughs> 
<laughs> love it. Okay, but uh, moving forward. So you obviously are a publicist. And let's mm-hmm. just talk a little bit about how you got to owning your own firm. And you obviously have, you know, multiple people who work for you now. And you're known to be like a really good boss as well as your you know, company has a great reputation. So what has it taken you to get to this point? Well, um, I mean, I suppose I, I've been doing this almost 30 years. I've been doing PR for 25 years, but I've been in the music industry for 30 years. So, I mean, I came after I graduated in at university in 1991, I became the ENTS officer for my students' union. So I was in charge of booking all the bands, putting on the gigs, running the student discos, you know, the, <laughs> the entertainment section of the student magazine, all that kind of stuff. And I was 21 and I thought this was great and I'd love to do something like this for the rest of my life. Um, And so the first job I got straight out of university was at Tower Records, which used to be in Piccadilly Circus. I mean, it hasn't been there for for years and years and years. Um, But it was, you know, I... uh, retail wasn't for me shall we say and and there had been people who'd been doing it for ages but I didn't like the shift out and it was just wasn't quite for me so I left after a while um after a few months and tried to get into any route I could to the music industry you know I realized being on a till selling CDs wasn't going to be my route into it and I was playing in bands at the time I was a drummer I was a singer and we were gigging and I was getting you know getting to know everyone and recording you know demos and everything um and over the course of um kind of a couple of years I was like a runner on a video and things like that and the, the director of the video phoned me up uh, of one particular video I'd been on phoned me up and she said would you like to come and work in a record company and I was like sorry what and it was mute records so of course you know mute at the time in the early 90s it was all Nick Cave and Depeche Mode and Erasure and I mean just yeah that was the that was the time absolutely fantastic so I came and got a very junior job in the international marketing team mm-hmm. I mean it was the first time I'd ever got email you know it was like <laughs> the most exciting thing sitting there with the computer and ping an email would come <laughs> from Israel reporting their sales figures um so I, I I kind of got started you know getting used to how record companies worked there and you know I did a couple of jobs within mute um until one day I got uh, well I mean I suppose the kind word would be made redundant, but I think actually it was sacked. Oh. Uh, my face didn't fit anymore, unfortunately. And uh, it was just one of those things where they shook a load of stuff up and, and a bunch of people just didn't have jobs anymore. And it kind of completely came out of the blue. Okay. And I, it knocked my confidence massively. And I think this is something that everyone in the music industry um, and industry generally, um, it happens at a certain point that mm-hmm. you lose your job or your job changes or you know things like that. And learning how to deal with that is a really important thing. So anyway, it felt like a punch in the guts, but I immediately went and registered at a, um, I think it was called Handle, yeah, Handle, the recruitment agency. Oh, they're still around, definitely. Yeah, oh, they're still yeah. around, yeah. And uh, and I got put forward for various other jobs, and I ended up working for Virgin in their credit control and all this kind of nonsense. Wow. It just wasn't, you know, but you're, you're on the periphery looking for every right. door, however you can get in. And all the time I was reading all the music press, and, you know, I was out at all the gigs, and everyone I knew at Mute I remained very friendly with, with the exception of one or two of the senior people who I never forgave. And, uh, and um and just kind of kept kept my head and, and thought, no, 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 I, this is what I do. I'm destined mm-hmm. to be in the music industry. So then I got a job in marketing at Roadrunner Records in the mid 90s. And um, I was marketing assistant there to a guy called Mark Palmer, who now runs Nuclear Blast Records, yeah. but at the time was MD of Roadrunner in the UK. And so I started off as his assistant uh, doing marketing, you know, everything from stuffing posters in tubes and all that kind of stuff. But I always got on very well with the head of press, Michelle. And they were looking for a new publicist to fill the role. And in the end, you know, after a few subtle hints from myself that maybe I would be better suited in PR than I would be in um, marketing, eventually Mark turned around and said, would you like a job as a 
publicist rather, you know, in, as a well, press officer, as we call mm. it in the UK. Would you like a job as a junior press officer? Move out of the marketing department and move into PR. So I was like, yes, thank you, at last. Um, so I started doing all the PR alongside Michelle for Coal Chamber and Machine Head and Fear Factory and all the bands that were on uh, Roadrunner. Um, Slipknot were just coming through just as I left. And, um, and so I really learned the ropes. Um, I knew all I knew all the music publications ever you know whether that was at the time Vox magazine of course Kerrang and Metal Hammers and all that lot but I knew them all very well and was really part of the heavy music scene which mm. you know music for nations roadrunner all that kind of stuff and we were all out of gigs every single night getting to know everyone getting to know all the journalists some of those journalists from the mid 90s are still very good friends of mine now and are still writing now um so I've got those contacts all the way through my career. But after a couple of years at Roadrunner, I got the opportunity to become a music journalist. So I left Roadrunner to set up a magazine called Rock Sound, which was- I didn't know the, this. That's yeah, so yeah. So this Rock Sound was a French publication and it had an Italian division and a Spanish division. And they wanted to set up a UK division. So I got approached and I said, yeah, yeah I, I can be editor, absolutely. You know, I edited a student magazine back in the day. I know how it's done. <laughs> I can write, which I can, and has always been one of the things I love doing. So I left Roadrunner and set up Rock Sound magazine and was its founding editor. And for the first year, oh my God, I mean, it was literally 16 hour days, seven days a week, putting a monthly music magazine together with no fucking budget. Um, but one of the greatest things in my career is that 20 years on, Rock Sound is still in print, still yeah. very successful, and I still work with them. I mean, we're just literally, this week it's been announced that Don Broco, one of the bands I work, there's a special edition of Rock Sound with Don Broco on the cover. So I still deal with them all the time. Um, and it's a very fond part of my life that uh, I did that as a music journalist. And after I left Rock Sound, because I was burnt out and just exhausted after a year of doing those kind of hours, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. I went and worked for a couple of uh, online publications, being, you know, just as the dot-com boom was happening, where there was loads of money in websites. And, uh, and so I went and edited some music magazines, music websites, retail websites for the most part. And uh, until the phone went and EMI asked whether I would consider moving back into PR because they had a role for me. And this was in the days when if, if a major record company wanted you to do an interview, or at least in my case, this was what happened. They sent a car to pick me up, to take me to the interview, and then to drop me back to my current job. Yo, that is not times. a thing anymore. Well, well, I mean, maybe they just really wanted me. But, you know, I did my first interview with the HR people, and then the interview with the head of press, and then the interview with the director of promotions. And uh, eventually they said yeah, yeah come come and work for us we'd like you to be you know a, a press officer for emi um so at the time skin from skunk and Nancy was just about to launch her solo career so they wanted me in particular with all the skills that i had in the rock industry mm. to take on skin's pr um which full circle you know 20 years later i'm now skunk and Nancy's publicist but uh so i i joined the company and i did everything i did you know dance music acts trance acts from belgium i did you know um indie acts every, every kind of thing pop acts the works i had a great time and i worked my way up through the ranks um at emi um over many many years and during that time obviously became iron maiden's publicist mm -hmm. um which has been the start of a relationship that's gone on for almost 20 years now, working with them across many, many albums and tours. Um, but I worked my way up through the 11 years I was at EMI to become director of publicity for Parlophone. And I also, you know, so I was head of press for EMI, director of publicity for Parlophone, and then worked across artists that were on Virgin, EMI, Catalog, everything. Um, until in 2013, so 11 years after I joined, I left and took, at the time, my entire roster with me. And Can you set do up that? My, oh, well, there, there was a lot of change going on at EMI at the time. It was yeah. at the time when Universal had bought part oh, of yeah. EMI. Was this, sell, was this back when EMI used to be considered like one of the four majors? Yes, and, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it was when EMI was one of the four majors. There was mm -hmm. Sony, EMI, Universal and Warners. Yeah. And EMI was put up 
So the Parlophone brand, which at the time I was director of publicity for, remained part of Warner's when, everything, when the rest of the company went to Universal. And then there was changes coming and Warner's were properly taking over. So I you know, was fortunate enough to take advantage of the fact that there was change and be able to leave the company. And because I was on very good terms with everyone and wonderful Andy Provisa, who was director of press for Warners, um, you know, sat down with him and said, I'd like to go and can I have Iron Maiden and Alice in Chains and Corinne Bailey Ray and Connor Maynard I was doing at the time and all this. And so it, it all worked out very nicely. And, uh, and with their blessing, I was able to set up my own company, Willful Publicity, mm. which I thought at the time would be just me by myself doing some PR for the artists I wanted to do. But of course, on I sent out an announcement. Hi, everyone, I'm leaving EMI and today's my first day as willful publicity and I've got these things and, you know, really looking forward to working with you. Bing, bing, the phone goes. Hi, would you like to do press for so-and-so? Hi, would you like to do press for so-and-so? And the phone just never stopped ringing. And so within two years, I had, I think, four staff working for me, offices, a huge roster, and that just kind of continued. And so I've been very fortunate because the team I've built around me um, are brilliant, and they've been with me now for quite some time, you know, many years. Mm. And um, we've got a roster that I think a lot of music publicists are quite envious of, which is uh, many strands across different uh, varieties of music. And we work with almost all genres. You know, I wouldn't say that we are um, specialists in uh, underground hip hop yeah. or, you know, deep jazz or things like that. But, you know, for, for the most part, we, we work across folk and country and metal and rock and pop and soul and blues and, and everything and work with all the majors and seem to have a fairly decent reputation and yeah. get results, which, you know, <laughs> is, is something I suppose to be proud of. So there's the long-winded version of my career history, which has taken me from leaving university thinking, I want a job in the music industry, to mm. having a successful PR company with staff. And look, I've hardly got any wrinkles to show for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's, okay, there's so many things to kind of like unpack here. The mm. first one I want to just like say to anyone, because I know that there are people listening who are wanting to break into the industry. That's sometimes, that's just what it takes. Like <laughs> for me to like move from Finland, obviously I did do my internship at Sony in Finland. So it helped to have that like major label stamp of approval mm. on my CV. But then I moved here with no knowledge of UK music at all, how mm. the industry works here. And uh, I had to do like one really crappy job for, it wasn't that long, like really only like seven months before I got um, got the offer from Universal, which was really lucky for me. But in that process, I gave up my entire other life. Mm. Like I was just all about it. So if you're right now in a position where you're just kind of like, oh, I really want to work in music, but I'm in university, I don't really know what to do. Honestly, those things, like what we look from, you know, interns and assistants is that did you you know, do the things that you could do at the time. So did you mm. run, you know, the clubs or did you work at the magazine? So all of that is actually useful. As, absolutely, you know, absolutely. I mean, I didn't have, I didn't know a soul when I was at university who worked in the music industry. I was, you know, I went to university as an 18 year old from Devon, the son of a priest. You know, I didn't know <laughs> a single person in the music industry. There was no step up for me. I didn't get, you know, oh, you know, so-and-so come right. in turn, or I'll give you this job. You know, literally I knew no one. Mm -hmm. um, but when I knew that I wanted to work in the music industry, there was, there was no other option for me. I wasn't going to be happy doing any other job. Yeah. And the thing that is really important for young people getting into the industry is the music industry is obviously hugely about who you know. Mm -hmm in many ways but the most important thing is it's what you know are you the kind of person who picks up and retains the information yeah. you need to be able to do the job and it's also about how you do things we used to have when i was at emi interns who would come in and within 20 minutes you'd be like you're never going to have a job in the music industry you haven't got a clue you know nothing you have you are utterly incapable of thriving in this environment, which sounds harsh, but it's true. And you would have other people who would walk through the door and their CV would just be like, 
why are you here? But instantly you'd connect mm -hmm. and you would know that they had the right kind of um, chemistry to be able to work in the music industry because the music industry is being able to deal with people and it's being able to understand what artists want, what what other people around you want because the music industry isn't like working in banking or working right. in travel or you know you have to be a particular type of person to work in the music industry especially in the kind of music industry that you and I work in which is very close to artists and managers mm -hmm. you know if you are scared of bad language or outrageous partying behavior or people being completely erratic and being hot-headed one minute and then very apologetic the next minute all those kind of things you need someone who's got a bit of charisma about themselves a bit of confidence about themselves a bit of humility a bit of understanding of where they sit in the pecking order because actually it's an enormously hierarchical system and you work your way up it and the amount of entitlement people come in right at the beginning of their careers and think well I want to do this and I know this and I should be doing this no <laughs> you don't you don't know anything yet you you know you've got years of experience to accrue mm. and it's all about that and it's also also very importantly I think for me and the way myself and my team operate is that you do things with integrity. Oh and the God, people yes. I know who do things with integrity in the music industry are the people who have careers in the music industry. I mean, there are some assholes that behave despicably who you can't understand why they're still in the music industry. Sometimes because they're powerful, who knows? Mm -hmm. But for the most part, the people I've known for the longest time in the music industry and who are the most successful and most well thought of are the ones with real integrity um, and they treat people well. And I think there's a misconception that people have that the minute you've got any form of power in the music industry, that you can lord it over people. And that is absolutely not something that I subscribe to at all. Every single person is important and needs to be treated that way. But... I may be the exception to the rule sometimes. So you have to have that yeah. thick skin. And when people join the music industry, you don't get everything handed to you on a plate. You know, if you're asked to go and make a cup of tea for someone because they're really busy and they need a cup of tea and they're too busy, go and make that cup of tea. Don't sit there and go, but that's not my job. Because at a certain other point, that person will go and make you a cup of tea. And that's how these jobs progress. When I was an assistant, I was just thinking about this um, the other day, like what has been like the weirdest thing that I've ever had to do like as an assistant. And it's not even for somebody, but I um, I worked on this, I might as well say, it was a years, years and years campaign. So mm -hmm. a big album campaign that came out a couple of, couple of years ago. And the concept around that album was fantastic. It was like to the date, to date it's like one of the most kind of detailed campaigns. Mm -hmm. And it had this like, um, imaginary futuristic world and and it had like symbol language and everything so um, the artistic director literally developed like a symbol language where mm -hmm. each like made up symbol was a different letter of the alphabet mm -hmm. and my job was to go over the artwork and make sure that there are absolutely no mistakes in it so I actually learned this fake alphabet <laughs> so that it would be easier for me to just be like yeah that reads correctly that reads correctly because I know this band has like uh, very very engaged fan base who will go after oh, all of the details spot so, any last mistake yeah, yeah exactly so I literally learned a fake language so my job would be easier so I was just like thinking that might be like one of the craziest things yeah, <laughs> yeah, but the, the thing is you have to be prepared to do that and you yeah. have to really be and you know in in what you do in the marketing world in a, in a major label and what I do having been through the major label world but being publicity mm -hmm. is you just have to put the hours in. You have to do the things that are required for the job, not required by your contract of employment, but required to be able to get the job done. Yeah. And sometimes that does mean learning a completely false alphabet, completely <laughs> fake language to make sure that you don't slip up. Sometimes it can mean taking that phone call at two in the morning because an artist on the other side of the world is, you know, Something something's happening that you need to be able to do or it means mm -hmm. working every weekend for eight weekends in a row because you've got bands playing at festivals and also doing your day job and also doing this and you know that's what the job requires you, you don't just clock in and clock out in this job it is a way of life and uh you have to be prepared for that yeah yeah true um okay so then 
there were a couple of things I wanted to kind of return mm -hmm. back there. Okay, yeah, one one thing that you mentioned, obviously, is the getting sacked part. Mm -hmm. And that's something I haven't actually discussed on this podcast before. I've mm -hmm. never been, um, you know, in that situation, luckily, knock on wood, <laughs> yet, uh, myself. But, like, how do you bounce back from that? Because, obviously, that can be, like, such a discouragement and a huge, just, like, not just your, not just your ego, but just, like, really, um, like, everything in your life like that can really I, think, I think it depends on the circumstances of it i mean you know some people get sacked because they've done something wrong yeah some people get sacked or what appears to be sacked because of redundancies mm -hmm. some people um you know they get on the wrong side of people there's all sorts of reasons yeah. you know mine felt like i'd been sacked I, I was technically made redundant along with a couple of other people, but the roles weren't made redundant. They wanted to bring some other people right. into the company. And so they had to um, make way for them. And there was a level of favoritism there. You know, the, the people that they wanted to bring in were favorites of senior management. And so junior people got let go. And for me, it was, you know, I, I was in the situation where I didn't see it coming. I saw it coming on the Friday afternoon when at two o'clock on Friday afternoon, I got an email pinged into my inbox saying, can you come and see, insert name of general manager here, um, at 5 p.m. And I was like, this is a bit weird. Why would I be going to his office at five o'clock on a Friday? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, my the pit of my stomach just kind of was like, oh, this doesn't feel like it's good mm -hmm. news. And it was, you know, oh, we love, William, we've loved having you here during this time. But as you know, this role has only ever been temporary. I'm like, that's news to me. Um, and we've got other people that we're bringing in. So unfortunately, you know, we're making some changes in the company and, and uh, we're going to have to let you go. But, you know, we'll pay you off and da da da. And I was I just sat there like, well, what? Yeah. And that night, I mean, I, I, I was 24, I think, when that happened to me. And I was just, I was, a, I was inconsolable. I mean, I really was. I just mm. thought this is the end of my career. Mm. And I, I couldn't work, I, you know, it was like I'd not done anything wrong. It was just the capriciousness of the music industry. And it was also employment law was different then. You could just get yeah. rid of someone, you know, it, 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 you could just decide to do it. Um, so for me, it hurt. It was, it was terrible. It, um, it was an awful, awful, awful feeling. And I, you know, I let that emotion out. Uh, I mean, I couldn't hold it in. You know, I just sobbed like a baby in my, you know, shared house that I was in with my friends who all sat around and, you know, offered me beer and, you know, tried to console me. And the next morning I woke up and felt angry. And, uh, you know, it was a Saturday morning. I felt quite angry. And I realised that it was because there was an unjustness to it. Mm -hmm. And what I'd felt the night before, the kind of grief and loss and shock, was because I thought this is my only chance. You know, I've yeah. lost my only chance. Yeah. The door has opened. I, I've been in a record company. I'm working in this great record company. Mm. Oh, my God, I've got, I, I haven't got anything to do. But the next morning I thought, no, I've, I've not done anything wrong. Everyone, at the, you know, the, everyone else at the record company, when they found out, um, we're just in shock and it was it was before we all have personal emails and personal phones so you know you weren't getting loads of texts from people going oh my god omg can't believe you've gone there, <laughs> yeah, there was none of that it was it, but but i started getting you know people phoned the home phone and we're just saying this this is you know are you okay this we've just found out this is terrible you know stick with it you, you'll be fine so the next morning i woke up and i was like no this isn't going to beat me i'm going to get another job and it will be a better job and I will do something else and it was finding the strength within me to know that I had the skills and the self-belief mm -hmm. that I should still be within this industry mm -hmm. um I'd not done anything wrong I'd not fucked up you know, everyone still really liked me. It was just unfortunate that, that they, there was someone they wanted in that role rather than me. So, um, so that Monday morning, I, you know, sat down, got my CV together, sent it to recruitment agencies, got back into the habit of going into 
record shops and looking in the back of Music Week to see what vacancies were there because I couldn't afford to buy Music Week. Um, and, and just, you know, going out and doing it. And I think that's the most important thing. If you have, it's back to that word integrity. If you have integrity and you've, you've not blotted your copybook and circumstance has unfortunately dealt you a blow, how you deal with that is how you write your future. Yes. You can't let what's happened in the past and what's just happened to you in an emotional punch bag way determine how you are going to um, create your future. And you create your future. You, mm -hmm. you know, the future doesn't just happen to you. You can be passive, but if, if you're passive, generally good things don't tend to happen. Good things come about because you have the right attitude and the right determination to effect that change. So I just sat there and thought, I'm not going to let this get me down. And so that was the first time in my career I'd been made redundant. And it happened a couple of times after that in different roles. Um, and I was always able to uh, make the right change. So for instance, when um, EMI was coming to its end and I was able to um, have the discussion to positively leave EMI and constructively take my artist with me and still work with EMI mm. because I was working with the clients. It was because I'd had the experience of knowing that you shape your own destiny. So rather yeah. than sitting there waiting to find out whether when the big jobs carve up was going to happen, I was ultimately going to lose my job. Mm -hmm. I took control of the situation and thought, well, what is it I, I want? I want to be able to carry on working with the artists I want. The way to do that is to put myself on the front foot and go and have this discussion at a senior level with the right people and say, hey, let's work together on a, you know, I, I can do this and we can all be very happy together. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great idea, William. Let's make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the experience of um, a wrecking ball swinging out from one side and knocking you completely off course and the shock and uh, hurt and dismay has has meant that I've always been very mindful that how I do things and how I react to things yes. and how I take charge of a tricky situation in advance how I can see it coming down the line and this is something that's imperative in PR you need to you know if a shit show is about to happen you need to be aware of it um that is um a really important life lesson that I learned early on in my career loyalty in the music industry often not always but often can go unrewarded and especially you know we learn this as as independent PRs bands and managers and record companies sometimes change who they work with mm. it's it can be uh, you know in some cases it can be really upsetting because you're just like well I've just done an amazing campaign mm. here why am I not working the the next record but the one thing that you learn is that an ending is a new beginning if you uh view it in that way it's not just an ending and as long as you have integrity and self-belief that you've done everything you can correctly good things will then happen again so you know that that was something that I learned all of that. those all of those things are exactly what I was actually thinking like as you were talking like all of the things that you create your destiny like obviously I'm a very spiritual person and I talk about it on the podcast as, podcast as well mm -hmm. but just like being in the energy of like when something shocking like that happens to you first you get over the shock and do your best to not react from that position mm. at all. Yes. Talk to your friends, talk to your mom, I don't know, talk to somebody, scream on the pillow, but on the outside, make it seem like you're, you know, thinking, just, you know, taking some time and uh, then absolutely. form a, an opinion, then form a plan and then go from there. Um, I think the problem that we have at the moment in modern society, and especially within the industries that we work in, everyone immediately takes to social media platforms yes. to express their viewpoint yeah. and to say, I can't believe that so-and-so has done this. Mm -hmm. And they vent in a public forum. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's very difficult to take that back yeah. Yeah. when especially 
when you are venting from a place of anger, hurt and disbelief yeah. and often not in possession of the full facts. Mm -hmm. So something may have happened to you that you call someone out on and actually there is a really good reason why it's happened. You're at the receiving end and it's unfortunate, but you don't understand that A has happened because X, Y, Z has happened in the background mm -hmm. yeah. and, and you end up causing more problems for yourself down the line. I think what you've said of take your time, you know, keep your counsel and then work out what it is you want to say. So yeah, the last thing anyone should do is react from a place of anger or hurt because they're going to not make the best and most informed step forward. No. And you mentioned a lovely word there, which I want to definitely get into more a shit show when it comes to PR stuff. So let's get into that. I got, um, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the podcast is because I've received um, questions just in general, of like how should artists, because we obviously live in a very touchy world right now. As you said, people are reacting, people are going to social media, whether they know what's happened or not. And sometimes that can be enough to do damage on somebody's career, whether the facts are correct or not, right? Absolutely. Um, so what are some of the do's and don'ts in those situations? Let's say that you're working with an artist. Um, it doesn't really matter at this, you know, hypothetical example of what level they are, but there's been a rumor and there's been, you know, maybe some press picking up on, okay, this is happening and this is a conversation on social media right now. How would you go about that so that it doesn't go into a full shit show? Well, I, I kind of work by the idea that of the four Bs, personally. Okay. Be honest. Be brief. Be sorry. Be quiet. Because if someone's accused of something um, that's absolutely uh, heinous, <laughs> you know, and is true, um, you are in a very different situation than a silly rumours going around about someone that's just false and, and you know, it, it'll blow over. Um, the, the worst thing I think that anyone can do um, immediately is react without thinking and you pour oil on the flames. So if someone has been caught out, for instance, um, I don't know, the, the, for whatever reason, and you know, I, I think you have to, as a publicist, your client has to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Your publicist can't do anything if they are not in possession, full possession of the facts. They need to know. So I think a publicist needs to have a very honest conversation with the client very quickly. You know, this is trending on Twitter. Is it is it true? Mm. If the artist client denies it to the publicist anything that the publicist does is not necessarily going to be long term in the best interest of the client even though they would think that they are acting as, as well as they can mm -hmm. um so be honest with internally and then if there is um the capacity to do so be honest own your transgression publicly and then be sorry, so apologize for it. So if you've been caught on stage, um, I don't know, uh, say you're, a, say you're a, a punk band and you've spat into the audience, or, or even not a punk band, say, say you've, you've thrown a plectrum into the audience and it's hit some poor kid in the eye and they've, oh, I can't really believe that. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Mm. Be honest, own it, you know. But it, it does depend what the transgression is because obviously yeah, there are yeah. certain things that are illegal. There are yeah, certain exactly. things that are, you know, very bad. Um, and you need to take legal advice before you do any of that. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, most things that people get called out on tend to be something they've said that has been taken the wrong way or something that they've done inadvertently. And the worst thing you can do in those instances is deny it, especially if it's on camera. And so, you know, be honest, be brief, be sorry. Mm -hmm. And then to a certain extent, be quiet. Don't keep engaging. Don't keep rolling and making a thing because most things blow over quite quickly. Yeah. So those things tend to be how I would approach something. Every single um, instance is completely different because you are dealing with a completely different 
situation, a completely different group of people involved. Mm. Um, so you you can't really um, do a one size fits all yeah, thing. Yeah. But but I do think those tend to be the maxims that I would uh, do. The most important thing is actually sometimes be quiet. Yeah, don't, that's don't such an interesting one because sometimes there there's been I can't remember like of an example right now, but sometimes something appalling allegedly has happened, and mm. then you go into the comments and and there's you know fans or people just being like I can't believe they haven't commented on this yet. Mm. So that was like a bit of a question for me. It's like I don't actually know if if you know being quiet is you know what, bad some, sometimes it depends on the legalities of things yeah. because um, depending on where in the world an artist is and where in a world a fan is who's accused them or you know it is something has something happened that has been on the news mm -hmm. you know is, is it a real thing or is it just fan conjecture all these different things and you know i can't believe so and so has not commented yet well actually it could be that they are having to take legal advice yeah. because they have been accused of something that actually their lawyers say do you know what this could if this goes the wrong way there could be ramifications um you can't just issue a statement mm -hmm. that is admitting it or denying it or provoking it or whatever um we have to take legal advice about any words that you put out mm -hmm. um so that could be why an artist has been quiet Sometimes it's that they're having to deal with the immediate shit show that is their personal relationship, mm, finding yeah. out about something. And it's far more important that they're having that conversation with their wife, yeah. husband, girlfriend, boyfriend, mother, whatever, of like, shit, this has happened. You know, it all depends what it is. And I think, you know, in, in this modern age, it is important to, you know, what I said about when... Uh, a bad thing happens to you in your own personal career to get ahead of it mm. and to uh, create your own destiny it is important to get ahead of the story and I think you know any PR or crisis management um, person would say get ahead of the story don't be playing catch up you know get, get ahead of it you know if you know it's coming do something to mitigate against it you know um, back in the old days of tabloid stings and you know you would get a phone call from whatever tabloid the day before a story was due to run going we've got all this evidence that so and so's done such and such will they comment um we will print the story tomorrow um if they don't comment we'll tear them apart if they grant us an exclusive interview oh, we God. will uh be nicer to them and there's the many worst. many 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 tabloid cases where i mean i can think of loads off the top mm -hmm. of my head where newspapers do that and you know the, the phone rings and your client is all of a sudden got to be publicly outed or something yeah. um, because some dreadful tabloid has decided that they're going to drag you over the coals but that's part and parcel you know if you're in the public eye that happens and if you put yourself out in the public eye you would traditionally expect if you have covering up a secret that someone's mm. going to sell their story now of course it's not quite the old thing of selling your story to the newspapers now it just breaks all over twitter yeah. and you know, <laughs> yeah. and it, it's everywhere and it's a very different thing because people expect instant responses mm -hmm. but i think you always have to take that deep breath and count to 10 and work out how it's going to play out and i genuinely if if something is true and damaging the less you say about it the easier in initially it is going to be able to deal with the initial allegation if someone accuses you of something that's just annoying you know i can't believe so and so was such a dick to me yeah right that's <laughs> and if someone accuses you of say for instance what uh mr brian warner marilyn manson has uh been uh accused of you know then it's a very different thing because yeah. lawyers get involved and there are criminal cases and everything so it there there is no one size fits all but yeah. honesty with the people around you so that they know what they're dealing with so that they can help you is really important so yeah i mean if we cut back in to to you know say you're marilyn manson and there's a criminal case and, and there's some very serious allegations obviously that's very different than if it's just someone um saying shit about you on social media mm -hmm. and everyone has to judge it but i do think be honest, be brief, be
be sorry if that's available to you, and then be quiet. Mm -hmm. All those things just have in your mind. And if you are an artist and something kicks up on social media, just think to yourself, do I need to respond? And how I respond is going to affect how this situation moves forward. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just a simple act of saying, I'm sorry, I messed up. You know, I take ownership of this. It won't happen again is actually the best option. And that's that's a maxim that's true for life as well as PR. Yeah, and like yeah. I say, I, I've always tried to operate how I operate um, as someone with integrity. And, you know, you try and do the least harm and behave in the best way. And that's how I always would give counsel to my clients. But of course, half the time you're dealing with artists and they might not be in their right state of mind. Yeah, yeah. That's such a tricky part. There's a couple of things that come up for me. And one is like, I always think when you're looking at some, you know, court cases or some like heinous crime has been committed. And obviously those people too need to have their lawyer, but imagine being that lawyer. So now I'm thinking like, oh my God, imagine being like, uh, you know, someone, some artists um, PR and mm -hmm. the artist has done something that's actually proven to be like really, really bad. Like that's equally must take a lot on, you know, the publicist and the team's you know, mental health and and they might get some hate mail and they might get some threats or whatever as a as a result of that so man yeah I, I mean I, fortunately that's never been something that uh, I've had to deal with yeah. um and I think you know it's every publicist's worst nightmare that all of a sudden you're the PR voice for a client who's done something um really bad how how do you deal with that and at what stage do you go do you walk away right and say i i can't do this and you know i i think everyone makes their own value judgments on that and sometimes the value judgment is literally the value of your client are you being paid an enormous amount of money to represent this client and under contract with them and oh my god mm. That doesn't often tend to be the case in the music industry because yeah. people aren't paid vast sums of money in PR anymore. Mm. Okay. But now it feels like a good time to actually start kind of wrapping up. This has been like such a good conversation. I'd had actually no idea about your entire career. Like I just knew you as a, you know, I knew that you had worked at Parlophone and I knew that mm. you have a long history with uh, Iron Maiden in particular, mm. but obviously like many, many amazing artists. I forever get grateful for you. Uh, taking me to see Alice in Chains a couple of years ago because obviously I'm a massive fan. I've still got like Alice in Chains uh, tattoo here. You, so. you hear Jerry Cantrell's new solo record, which is coming out at the end of October. It's amazing. It's always, absolutely fantastic. You'll always be blown on. Away. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's been lovely speaking to you. And you know, I I don't tend to you know you don't get a chance to talk about your own career very often. Ah. And you know, it's for most you know it's kind of dull sometimes, but it's quite interesting to think about it in retrospect and think about. 30 years of doing this three decades of being in the industry and you know it, it takes a long time sometimes to get to where not necessarily you want to be I mean I never had a great desire to hey I'll be running my own PR agency and but you know the, all these things are stepping stones to getting to you and you just need to remain focused on what it is you want to do and who it is you want to be that's the mm -hmm. most important thing behave in the way that you want people to think of you because yeah. you, you know the, you're only as good as the worst bit of your reputation because the worst bit of your reputation travels far people say bad things about people far more than they say good things about people this is so true oh my god that's that's such a good slogan my my favorite one is just i remember i um before i moved into the music mm -hmm. industry i worked at a horse breeding farm and we had a um, wonderfully talented she's now an olympic writer oh, wow. um and she had a bit of a mishap with her ex-boyfriend's best friend and i accidentally blurted <laughs> it out loud <laughs> and she she at first i was like oh my god I, i'm sorry i didn't know that no one knew and then she was like oh, it's okay if you don't want people finding out about the stupid shit you do don't do stupid shit so like that's what kind of exactly <laughs> exactly exactly you just gotta do that and i mean the I, just earlier when i said there are, you know when we're advising client clients the the four b's you know mm. actually there's a fifth b that i think is really important in life but especially working in the industry if you're trying to get on and get in be kind yeah. just be kind you know don't be a dick don't do things to fuck other people over don't be that person that everyone else is gonna hate be kind 
good things happen if you're kind mm. yeah. and you feel a lot better about yourself <laughs> yeah, exactly well on that note thank you so much for being on the show my and pleasure look, i look forward to watching it <laughs> yeah i look forward to hopefully working with you in the future on other projects absolutely i'm sure we will Anna. and to everyone else listening i will see you in the next episode thank you for listening to break the record podcast i hope you enjoyed this episode as much as i did now more than ever is the time to make a positive change in the music industry so if you would like to support this message you can leave a podcast review on itunes or take a screenshot and tag the anna turunen on instagram stories i'd love to share the love of my stories Also, for comments and questions, you can DM me. Stay tuned for an all-new episode next week.